It's your first test of the year. Congrats, you made it this far. <laughs> it's a big deal, right? Um, keeping in mind, there are going to be eight tests this year. Okay? Eight tests, not 12. Now, we're used to three per quarter, but since we've changed over the new schedule, we're really only doing two or three per quarter, and it's from a class to class basis. So I, in physics, am doing either two or three. In AP, it's going to be two. Okay? One at the mid-quarter, which we're at now about, and one at the end of the quarter. So test one will cover chapters, or chapter three, and then chapter two, specifically two one through two five. Now, we didn't really use chapter three out of the text very much, but we did cover it. We didn't directly refer to those sections. So while we're sitting here, let me explain to you what I mean. So chapter three is vectors and their components. So if you recall, we did stuff with vectors. So three one, for sure, I'm just letting you know what sections it covers. We did it out of the Barron's book a lot, if you recall, if you remember back to that. Um, so three one for sure, Let's see. 3, 2, I'm just going to put a dash because it's going to be up to probably 3, 3, I think. 3, 3 is scalar product, good, and vector product, good. Oh, it's the whole chapter, sorry. Three, it's only three sections. So it's 3, 1 through 3, 3. Now, I did not assign any math homework or quantitative homework from this section. So if you want a little bit of practice, I'll send you guys some sample questions you should look at out of chapter 3 in the next two days. You did a lot already with vector addition, with the, product, uh, the scalar rule, the, uh, the cross rule, the cross product rule, um, with what we called, if you remember, the components, the x and y components, breaking it into components. We also talked about what I called unit vectors, i, j, k, remembering that i is with the x direction, j is with the y, k is with the z. So chapter three was more of a, I think, overview of a section, not as math heavy as chapter two is going to be. So you could expect more of your math to come from chapter two later in the test. You can absolutely expect your vector rules and all the stuff to show up in multiple choice, maybe some short answer, and maybe like one problem at the end with the math problem for vectors. Okay, just to give you an overview already. Um, all right, at the end of each chapter, I want you to note that there are, God bless you, summaries. So this summary of the chapter is on page 55 right here. And chapter two summary is right where I was, was on page 30 to 31. Okay, and again, these are the summaries. So if you want to be looking at summaries, which I definitely would look at summaries 100%, they really outline the key important facts of that chapter. Now, in, God bless you, in chapter two, we obviously did not, I shouldn't say obviously, we didn't finish the last section, which is 2-6, which is fine. I actually am happy we didn't, because it has to do with a different idea. It's related to kinematics, but it's a different idea, so I'm glad we're starting off the next chapter, or next test with that. So it's really 2-1 through 2-5, so you don't worry about that last part. Although in the review, they don't even talk about that, actually. They don't talk about section 2-6 in the review. So you don't have to worry about like saying, oh, I'm reading this and I shouldn't be reading it. It's not even covering the review. <coughs> um, okay, let me think for a sec. So I did not assign a problem set for the first test. Now, I, I said I was going to assign a problem set, so I'm not like forgetting it, trust me. I'm also trying to keep reasonable amounts of work in your life. So I know that you've done 2-1 to 2-2. Two, two. Today you do is 2-3 two, two to 2-4. Two, 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 tomorrow is the multiple choice, right, for chapter 2. Is that tomorrow or is that yesterday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the multiple choice for chapter two for you guys. So I know you've had a lot of problems already. I don't want to say, though, that it doesn't mean you shouldn't practice for the test, because you absolutely should. Um, so what I think I'll do, and this was Alex's recommendation, what I think I'll do is tonight I'll send you more problems from chapter two and chapter three. If you do them and submit them, that's fine. Maybe I'll give you like an extra credit or something like that. I'll count it as a little bit of bonus for practice. But I don't want to see like you half-ass work and just submit anything and expect to get extra credit, okay? So it's not about like the actual points. But if you want to get credit for something, because I know it does feel good to get credit for work you do, I'm happy to tack that on as like, you know, a portion to your test grade if that would help. So consider that. So I'll send you chapter two and three problems to practice a couple more. And it'll probably only be like three or four from chapter two and three or four from chapter three. Okay, but if you find that you're 
confident in what you've done already and don't need the extra review and you're doing fine with it and you can do well on this test and practice the homework problems <coughs> only and the multiple choice questions, that's fine by all means. You can do that. <coughs> I know last year, Sure. Um, so for conceptual, you can answer verbally. You can, I remember the four methods I talked about earlier this year. You could answer verbally. Verbally, you could answer graphically. You could answer numerically, and you could answer algebraically. You could answer with more than one way to validate the other way. So if you give a verbal response, but you find that maybe it's a bit unclear what you're saying, and therefore you show a figure to then validate or back that up. That's fine also. So any of those methods are fine, Tristan. Um, when you can use algebra, when you can use equations, when you can use numerical values and graphs, it's really powerful. It's probably more powerful than your verbal response. But your verbal response can validate those other types of responses. So if you show with a graph what it looks like and then you validate it verbally with a caption, that'd be great. Okay? Yeah, any of those are fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like Extra questions I might give you? Yeah. No, oh, multiple choice. choice. Got it. Uh, do you, so this is a multiple choice, but it would be like similar to that on the test. And is there, is like there difficulty a, wise? Yeah. Yeah. The ones, the ones that I've been giving you as practice, I've been looking at them before I sign them. So I make sure that they're reasonable difficulty. And then also, um, come back to me. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, multiple choice sets are good sample problems already. Yep. Um, not about their tests, but what's the difference between them? problem set and just like a set Sorry, of yeah. So homework nightly are like regular assignments. A problem set is just a set of problems, but I traditionally in the past have assigned that like earlier on in the chapter. So say you're doing the 2-1 homework normally and you finish 2-1 and 2-2 like last week when it was due, you would then go to the problem set maybe later in the week and say, all right, let me practice a couple more from 2-1 and 2-2 specifically geared to the test. It's pretty much a review packet that I used to make due the day before the test. But because you guys were on Kairos, I, wasn't, I was like about to assign it and I talked to Alex about it. He's like, listen, students are doing their work right now and they definitely have a lot of work with the labs you've been doing, with the actual homework. So the problem set might not be a good thing to assign. It was gonna be over the weekend and then do, do today really. But I pushed that back. I instead made the homework due today instead of the homework that was gonna be due today was originally gonna be due Monday. So anyway, a problem set is a review packet. Because of timing, because of Kairos, because it's the first test, I didn't make it due, but I don't want you to think that it's not important to practice. So what I'll do again is I'll send out problems tonight that will be your problem set for the first one. But I think what I'll start doing is counting it as like extra credit on your test. Now, it'll be graded for correctness. It's not gonna be graded for completion. So let's say I might offer up to five bonus points on the test for the problem set. And let's say Kara gets half the problems right. She'll get two and a half points of, of bonus. Does that make sense? Okay, it's not gonna hurt your grade. It will not hurt your grade by doing the problem set. The last thing I wanted you to feel like, if I didn't get it right, I'm gonna lose points at my grade right now. I want you to do it as practice, okay? But the proportionality of what you get right will go into your extra credit or into your portion of the test grade for that. Is that clear what I'm saying? Okay, maybe for the test, maybe going on, I'll make the second test like five of the 50 points is worth from the problem set and then you have to really push yourself to get it right. But for the first test, because I know time is of an essence right now, I'll make it really more of an extra credit for the first test only, okay? And that was honestly conversing with Alex that I talked about, yeah. And then for multiple choice, I know there's several problems, hard problems in the textbook, there's answers, and there's answers available. I'm gonna put those up. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna send you the problem set tonight, but I'm also going to put, and I'm, I'm gonna put these on Moodle, but I'll send you an email to, to, to remind you. I'm also gonna put, ready? Homework solutions for 2-1, 2-2, 2-3, 2-4. I'll put them all up. So when you come in on Friday to talk to Alex, if you really don't understand it after going through the solution, you need to talk to him. I want to see, everyone should be here on Friday. Second, uh, first period, in room 401, I think he does it, right? In room 401, I know you have class, I know that. What class is it again? Stats. If there's a chance you can miss the first half, Mr. Fiore, be okay with that, and you can get some questions answered, because it is a test, you can do that, God bless you. Um, the only other day that you had with Alex was day six, which wouldn't help you at all for the test. So keep that in mind. If you feel confident in stats and you can miss half the period and make that up, talk to him individually because you have a good relationship with him, okay? But that's up to you, Max, okay? Um, but two, one, two, two, three, two, four, I'll give you the solution. 
Um, I'll give you some practice problems with 2-5 also, obviously, because we just did 2-5 today, so I can give you that solution. The problem set questions, I will not give you the solution right away, because I want you to struggle through them on purpose. That's how you should be doing these, struggling through the problems. And I use the word struggling as a good thing. I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean pushing yourself to persevere. Persevere, struggle is the same word, right? One is positive connotation, one is negative. But push yourself to get through the problems. Don't jump to the solution right away. I know the solutions are Slater, so you could check there also, I know that. So you could do that, but it doesn't help you to stop halfway through a problem and give up and look at the solution. Because it will look so easy, and it'll be like, oh, I get this, that's how you do it. But it's not what is gonna help you to learn. Trust me, I've been in your seats before. Solution manuals existed for a long time. It was very easy when I was in college to look up the answer and be like, oh, I get this, and then get to the test and be like, I don't know how to start this problem. Because I didn't learn how to navigate the problem, which is what you're learning while doing the problem. A solution doesn't teach you how to navigate. It teaches you how to get to the one answer that they choose, the one method that they choose, or the author chooses. Again, you saw today, there are many methods for several problems, okay? Um, I'll also, as I answered for Kara, I'll put the multiple choice solutions for chapter two and three also, okay? Now, the chapter two is due tomorrow, so I'm not gonna put that solution up tonight. I want you to go through the chapter two multiple choice tonight that is due tomorrow, and then I'll put that answer up tomorrow so you can see it, okay? Interesting. Difficulty-wise, absolutely, yep, absolutely. Also, for like problems, yep. Two or three. It's not going to be a one for a quantitative at the end. You know where the one will show up? Multiple choice. Multiple choice. The level ones that were, I mean, you look at the level ones. They're really quite simple. And there are not many of them, you notice. They're more level twos. So your tests will mainly be level twos, but I'll probably toss in like a level three in there as one question on every test. And that'll be a tough question. But again, this is the kind of course where your grades are going to be scaled. You're going to have a grade. You're going to have a curve most likely for tests. So we'll talk about that as test grades come up. Okay? And Ms. Byers has done that for AP Bio, so I'll be talking to her about how she does that. Um, because again, your test problems, if they come from AP exams, and a five on a physics exam is like, for the most part, it's like a 70%, 60% of the questions right. Well, if they're scaling it that much to a five, then I'm gonna be thinking of like a five as like the A in this class. A B is like a four. So if you get a B on a test, it means you're at like the four level. So your grade might be scaled accordingly. Does that make sense what I'm saying? You really want to be above a three on the AP exam. So if you're above a C, that's what would be a three. But if you're getting ones and twos, that's not really going to be an acceptable grade for the AP exam. We want threes and hires, really. We don't want ones and twos in this class, right? So if you're like an EDM test, that means that you can see You're probably on like a level of like a three, a little low three right now. But then like what would that translate Say it one more time? Like what would that translate into like numerical I have to come up with a scale. I haven't honestly done it yet, Max. I'm gonna create my own algorithm that converts from one to the other. And it's gonna be simple. It'll probably be something that's linear for the most part, but I have to look at that. I haven't, I haven't done this yet, to be honest. Uh, yeah. I, I've taught AP Calc before for three years when I was in my old school, so I've gone through the process of scaling things to an AP kind of score, so I'll use that same technique. Do as best you can, right? Obviously on every test, do, do as best as you can. And again, this first test, this material is pretty easy. So that scale might not be something that you should really rely on for the first test as much because this topic is a pretty easy topic. Now, can there be tough problems? Sure there can. There absolutely can be tough problems, okay? So I'll keep that in mind as I grade your test. Um, what other questions so far? You want to go over some? Yeah. Sorry, is it test out of 50 or is it out of 100? I haven't decided yet. Okay. I haven't decided on that yet. I'm making, your, excuse me, I'm making your labs out of 100 for every lab. I've decided that one last night because it doesn't make sense for me to start doing this point system scale I did last year. I did that last year in regular physics because a lot of the labs were more difficult than others, so they were weighted differently. For the most part, your labs are all going to be, we do it in class, you guys work on it outside of class, you have a write-up for it, you turn it in, so you can expect the length and the difficulty for labs to be similar throughout the entire year. So that's why those are 100. Like Mr. Yeah, so sometimes last year the tests in my class were either 45 or 50. That's like the scale that I went about. I haven't really decided, but whether it's 50 or 100, it's just double the values, obviously, right? So if it's out of 100, every point you lose is worth a point. Out of 50, every point you lose is worth two points in a percentage mindset, right? In a percentage mindset. 
And I did traditionally, if I did it out of 50, my multiple choice were two, which really means it's worth four out of 100, okay? And that'll probably stick. That probably won't change. And your multiple choice are usually like a third of your test, your short answer a third, and your math a third. For the most part, if I'm gonna scale it in either direction, it'll be multiple choice 30%, short answer conceptual 30%, quantitative 40%. That'll be the leaning I'll go toward. It's very rare that I'm gonna lean the other way, okay? Does that make sense what I'm saying? It'll be leaned heavily on your math at the end, maybe once in a while, but more multiple choice, but it's never gonna be heavily on conceptual. Okay, it's not gonna be heavier on the middle part of the test. Uh, what else, what else, what else? The full period. That's gonna vary test to test, yeah. But you'll have the full period for the test. You'll have the full period. I do not, I absolutely do not say like, oh, we didn't finish, you come after school. Will never happen, just so you're aware. Ever, will never happen. If everyone for some reason didn't finish and I completely screwed up the timing, I will know and I will take that into account. But if you have problems skipped throughout the test, that doesn't mean you ran out of time, right? If you have a bunch of problems literally skipped with no work, sure, like, oh, I didn't want to waste time on that. But if it's completely blank at the end of the test, there's a good chance you didn't know it. And you know what? If you could have had come back to, time to come back you, and you knew it, you probably would have come back. So I'm going to be using logical reasoning here, okay? So please don't like, you know, oh, we all didn't finish, so we're going to come after school. It's not going to happen at all. It will not happen. Um, let's see. I want to see if there's anything specific in the book that I can give you more assistance with to help. So in each section, you'll notice it does section them off. So that is useful, like two, five, there's a bunch of problems for each. And then after that, so like, this is chapter two, for example. It says additional problems. So this is page 37 through 39 in chapter two. Pages 37 through 39. This is like where you'll see a mix up of problems where it might involve topics from 2.1 and 2.4 at the same time. It might involve questions from 2.2 and 2.5 at the same time, okay? So I would definitely consider that. And what I'll try and do is, for the problem set questions, I'll try to pull them from there so you get an idea of that. Those do not have difficulty levels next to them. Those are all gonna be twos and threes, just a heads up. Okay, they're not gonna be level ones in that section. Um, the same thing goes for chapter three. At the end of chapter three, you're gonna have the additional problems, which start with problem number 45, and that's pages 59 through 61. Okay, again, I'm using, again, the Walker text. You could use other texts to look at sample problems as well. Okay, John Coley from last year, if you guys still have that, the difficulty level three problems are great problems. They're not gonna involve any calculus, but they're definitely problems that are useful to look at if you want to, if you want more. But again, these books have so many problems that I don't think it's going to be a question of can you find more anywhere. Yeah. Um, so do you suggest studying for these tests, like just going into summaries and reading, and just like overviewing the information and then doing a ton of problems like back at home? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'll tell you right now, when I took AB Physics in high school, we had problem sets. My teacher used to call it a, a cow book. Anybody ever hear that phrase before? A cow book? You know those composition notebooks that have like the, the marbles outside? It looks like a cow. So he called it cow book assignments. All right, cow book assignment, uh, it was weird, but it was problem sets. <laughs> and yeah, we would be, and I'm not kidding, we'd be assigned like say, for the span of one test, which is about what you guys have in length, maybe 15, 20 problems, and we'd be getting through them, and you know what we'd do? After those 15, 20, if I felt like they were too easy, I'd go to the text and pick other problems and start doing more and more problems. You're not gonna run out of sample problems. Okay, keep that in mind. And if you pick more problems and you can't get them, ask me, ask for help. And if I'm not at school, if it's tomorrow night, I can send you a solution to one problem. I have the whole solution manual for this book. So I don't even have to write it up. So don't worry about wasting my time or being like, oh my God, Mr. Howell, you have to write up the solution. I'm probably not gonna write up the whole solution my own tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. But if I'm awake and you send me an email and I can quickly copy and paste the solution, I'm happy to do that. Now again, Slater has solutions also for you to check. They're not always right though. You guys notice that? They're not always right. So keep that in mind. And they're not always the proper way to approach the problem. So keep that in mind as well, all right? Anyhow, that's my spiel. We have a little bit of time. We've got like five, 10 minutes. Yeah, Matt, are you good? I have a question on the from last time. Yeah, good. What, what problem we have? Um, 
I'm gonna pause test review at this. Actually, I'll continue it on the test review. What am I saying? Leave it on. So I'll post this video later on, okay? I'll post the test review video. It's about 20 minutes at this point. Can um, you give me a page number and a, and a probably prompt? Probably 35 or 37 from 34. <coughs> I'm just kind of um, interested in more of the wording of it. What number was it? 34? 30, oh uh, yeah, 34 and 35. Which one, Matt? It's just, it's like almost the same. What was the problem number then, Matt? You gave me the page numbers, 34 through 35 is the page yeah, numbers. 35 on 34. Oh, got it, okay. <laughs> so it's number 35, got it, on page 34. Yeah. Let's read it together real quick out loud. So we're looking at this problem again that says, figure 227, oh, we gotta start with that. So let me just draw the figure so we can see it so we're clear. Oh. <laughs> Did you uh, use figure 228? Okay. I was well, so confused. Yeah. But it's red and blue. Figure 227 is the red car and the green car, and they're moving towards one another. Oh my gosh, I said figure. But if you look, there's a graph with a blue and a red line next to it. That's figure 228. I was literally, I'm like, that's okay. I think in number, in number 35, it says you use both actually, so don't worry about it. Because the other one uses. Yeah, so the... It's just confusing because they, the, the red car has like a blue line and the green car has... Yes, that is so effed up. Oh my gosh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, what, yeah, okay. Okay, so, so here. It's labeled though. So here, look. They wrote XG0, position of the green car initially. So although that line was red in the book, this line is actually your green car. That makes no sense. Oh my God. And then the red car is actually this line right here. Sorry. That's the red car, and this said XR0, position of the red car initially. In the book, though, those lines, this is red in the book, and this is blue. That is really dumb, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that really Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. You would set the equations for each other. The position equations you're going to want, yes. You see what he's saying? So we, we, it, let's look at the problem. It says, shows a red car and a green car moving toward each other. Figure 228 is a graph of their motion showing the positions XG0, 270, XR0, negative 35. So this guy is the negative 35. That's why the y-intercept down here, right, is negative. And this is the positive position of 270. So that's the green car at 270. So where's the origin in this problem? Here's the origin. This is at a position of negative 35 to start. This is at a position of 270 to start. So, it says the green car is a constant speed and the red car begins from rest. What is the acceleration? What is the acceleration magnitude of the red car? Well, according to the graph, they meet at 12 seconds. That's important. That's on the graph right there. Without the 12 seconds, you can't do this problem. Okay, you cannot do this. Let's write the position function for the green car. The position function for the green car is going to be xg equals x0 plus v0t plus one half at squared, but we're told, let's see, that the green car has a constant speed. So what do I drop off? Look what I'm doing. I do that a lot. Get used to it. If a whole entire term, a term is separated by a plus or a minus sign, if a whole term drops off, I do that all the time. The position of the green particle is what we're trying to figure. That equals the position of the red. The initial position is negative 35. I'm oh, sorry, no, is 270. Its velocity is 30, uh, 20. And they combine or they collide after 12 seconds. So you're going to be able to figure out the position of the green car already. See that? You're going to be able to figure it out by just doing the math. But... Do you guys have a rush right now, or can I keep going for another second? 